Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Russell Gray. He is the director to the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. He also holds an adjunct position in the School of Psychology at the University of Auckland. His research spans the areas of cultural evolution, linguistics, animal cognition, and the philosophy of biology, and we're going to focus on those topics today, particularly cultural evolution, linguistics, and animal cognition. So, Dr. Gray, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. A pleasure to be here. Okay, so let's start with your work on linguistics. So, I mean, first of all, do you have any specific position when it comes to some of the main debates going around in linguistics, like, for example, uh, the sort of Chomsky and side of things where we have uh, language as uh, an innate trait, let's say, uh, an innate cognitive mechanism and things like universal grammar or the other side where people say that it's not innate at all, that it's much more the result of learning and culture and so on. So, I mean, do you have any specific position when it comes to that debate? Uh, yes, I guess I do, um, but I wouldn't put myself in exactly either of those camps. Um, so uh, I am skeptical of the universal grammar. I, I don't think anybody believes in universal grammar uh, in, anymore. Um, that, that, that was uh, a long time ago. And I think most generalists have moved way on from that. I mean, after universal grammar, there was principles and parameters. Um, and you know, then more recently, the, the sort of move to minimalism. Uh, and from universal grammar to principles and parameters and then to minimalism, increasingly the, the content was becoming kind of less and less, but much more kind of abstract. So with, you know, universal grammar, there was a sort of strong empirical claim with principles and parameters, a, a slightly weaker empirical claim about uh, the, sort of the specificity of constraints that the, um, our biological heritage encoded in our brains would impose on the diversity of languages. And with minimalism, it's, it's so minimal, it's hard to know exactly kind of what kind of predictions you might uh, really see and how to engage that uh, in a way that links to the diversity of the world's languages. Um, so I think in some ways the, the minimalism position is is more realistic because it requires less of a major evolutionary leap. But in, if it all comes down to this very uh, abstract notion of, of merge, um, it's, it's not coupled typically to uh, much that you can investigate empirically as far as I can see. Um, but certainly I would... Um, I would want to uh, probably nuance my position in terms of some of the things we've claimed before. Uh, for example, we had a, a, a with my collaborators, Michael Dunn, Simon Grendel and Stephen Levinson, we had a paper looking at putative claims about word order universals. And um, uh, some generalists had seen these as kind of a, a surface instantiation of uh, underlying principles and, and, and parameters. And so it seemed like a, a way of engaging uh, with some kind of empirical claim. And what we found out was that these putative word order universals weren't anything like as universal as had previously been, been claimed. Uh, there was some commonality, commonalities, but there was also striking differences in different languages, families. So I think what we said at the end of the paper was that at least with respect to word order universals, uh, culture trumped cognition. Sorry to use the Trump uh, word there, actually, uh, but that's, that's I think, what, what we said. Um, and I specifically wrote in the kind of caveat about at least with respect to word order universals. Um, but I think these days I, I wouldn't even want to go that far because we, we just looked at four language families then. And now uh, we're currently running analyses uh, where we look at these patterns uh, across all of the major world's language families. And I think there are some uh, generalities and commonalities that come out of it. Uh, 
And so my position would not be that cognition plays no role, but that its role is probably quite a lot weaker than it, than some linguists might have thought, and much more likely to be kind of context dependent, and therefore you're much more likely to see uh, language family specific patterns. I think we were looking at something, we're looking at something like uh, 130 putative language universals, and only about a third of those turn out to be really uh, statistically robust. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in your work, some of your analyses revealed striking language family specific dependencies. So, what does that tell us, and specifically about the claims made by generative linguists? Well, it, it depends, like, as I said, there's, there's different, uh, historically different takes on generative linguists. Uh, I think these days, like Chomsky would just say he doesn't care about uh, putative universals because the, the focus is on these just very abstract things. But at least in a principles and parameters type account, there, there were claims about uh, linking these deeper cognitive processes to, to the word order universals. And, and, and what I would say is, I think, not that cognition doesn't have a role, uh, but that uh, local uh, lineage specific linguistic patterns, uh, perhaps due to the origins of certain kinds of verbs and things, those can constrain things more than kind of relatively weaker cognitive biases. Uh, but in saying that, one of the things that's been worrying me quite a lot recently is the sort of implicit model here. That on one hand, you've got culture, and on the other hand, you've got sort of biologically wired in cognition. And I, I think I, I'm not really comfortable with that dichotomy. I think the kind of thing I'm much more interested in now is, say, how cultural factors might uh, change uh, our kind of cognitive processes. It might even change some of the wiring in their brain. Uh, I've been really intrigued with some work done by uh, uh, Angela Federici and her colleagues uh, showing that the type of language you speak uh, can uh, change the, the density of neurons out of different regions of the brain. Um, I think that's, that's really fascinating because it suggests much more dynamic interplay between culture and cognition rather than seeing them as separate and opposing. Right, that's very interesting. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of languages. Uh, you have this approach in your work called Bayesian Philolinguistics. Could you tell us about it and what we can learn about the evolution of languages through this approach? Right, I think we can learn a lot about uh, using Bayesian phylogenetic methods. Uh, these methods are really the method of choice in kind of, or the methodology of choice in evolutionary biology these days. It's about building phylogenetic trees, trees showing nested patterns of descent, kind of genealogies, family trees, if you like. And the, the Bayesian approach um, uh, takes information, uh, takes some data. So typically we might take what linguists call cognates, but you could take, uh, these are words that are homologous. Uh, systematic sound correspondences show that they derive from a common source. But you could take other kinds of data. You could take you know, structural features of language. You could take innovations in phonology or morphology. It, it doesn't have to be uh, cognates. And then you need some model about how those, those traits evolve. And in the Bayesian approach, you also have uh, priors, priors about the kind of processes of tree formation, priors about rates, prior information, say, about possible dates. And then given the model and then given the data and given the priors, you infer uh, a posterior distribution of these language family trees. And the cool thing from my point of view is not just to have the trees, put them on your wall and have a look at them, but to see how they can be used to answer questions. Questions say about, you know, where did language families come from? When did they arise? What shaped their spread? Uh, questions about like, what was the ancestral kind of form uh, of the language, um, and questions about how different parts of language might be coupled closely together, causally kind of linked, and questions about what drives 
the diversification processes of language languages like why in some parts of the world do you see only a small number of languages or in other parts of the world like Vanuatu where I where I uh, do some work and my department does some work you know there's something like uh, 140 different languages uh, spoken by maybe around 300,000 people so I think this all sorts of compelling questions about the evolution of language, their origin, their spread, what drove the diversification. And these Bayesian tools from evolutionary biology can really help us answer some of those things. Mm -hmm. And how do you integrate cultural phylogenies with horizontal transmission? Yeah, this is a common question because, of course, in building trees, you've got this diversification process. You don't um, have uh, in the, the, the tree model, these horizontal or, or kind of borrowing events. And so often what people will say, are you, you know, what you're doing must be completely wrong because there's some borrowing and, and there certainly is borrowing like that. Um, uh, so the question is not, is trees the only thing you should be doing? Uh, the question is, can trees be used to answer certain kinds of questions and, and what data do you need um, to answer those questions? So we often use what's called basic vocabulary. That's words that are spoken most often because those tend to be relatively stable and, and relatively less likely to be borrowed. And typically we'll remove the, the borrowings from the analysis. So you get trees that reflect the um, pretty well the uh, initial patterns uh, of uh, language splitting. Now, that said, um, and one of the good things actually about using trees, if you're really interested in, in borrowing, you want to be able to separate what's due to descent, what's due to genealogy from what's due to borrowing. So you actually need trees in order to see the non-tree like things, the things that don't fit on the trees. So I think often there's, there's a bit of an opposition between um, thinking if you do trees, you're denying borrowing. Actually, if you want to see the things that are borrowed, you, oh, it's very helpful to have a tree because you can see the things that don't fit tightly on it. Um, but still, uh, that's not, going to make everybody happy because people might say, well, even if you remove the known borrowings, there'll be some uh, undetected borrowings that might mess up your inferences. And that could be true. And my colleague Simon Greenhill and I have done some simulations to try and investigate uh, how significant the impacts are. And uh, in the cases we simulated, you required really quite high levels of undetected borrowing to substantially screw up the kind of inferences. So, um, borrowing certainly happens, and if you're particularly interested in borrowing, say you, you, you really want to know uh, what were the things that were borrowed between particular languages, or you want to know what are the sort of general patterns about borrowing, then you, you need methods that go beyond kind of trees. And those haven't been as well developed, either in evolutionary biology or in linguistics, as the tree-based ones, but we, we're starting to see some progress. Um, I, I, Ironically, although I'm a kind of fan of trees, I'm a, I'm a tree hugger, uh, I was one of the people who I think first introduced certain kinds of networks to, to linguists, uh, these neighbor net diagrams as a way of visualizing non-tree-like signal in your data. And they're useful, but they, they don't exactly recover all the, the sort of horizontal transmissions. They're just more data visualization. So I, I went to um, a lovely talk actually by uh, Nico Nurita yesterday, an online talk, where uh, he was discussing some methods he's been developing that will more explicitly infer the, the borrowings. And uh, so I think uh, increasingly we will see uh, methods that not only build trees, but also can reconstruct kind of patterns of, of borrowing. That's challenging, it's computationally challenging, it's challenging from a modeling point of view, but I think uh, real progress is, is being made there now. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned that because one of the questions I had here is if a tree is really the best way of representing the evolution of languages or if could be if it could be something else like a web or something else yeah no good question and historically in the in linguistics there's been uh, proponents of the kind of tree view um, you know, going back into the 1800s and very shortly after proponents of a wave model that you know arguing against the tree kind of view uh, my view is that you don't need to take an a priori position on these things uh, and um, that it's an empirical question how tree-like or non-tree-like particular kinds of data are. And it might also be the case that um, 
different parts of language have different kinds of histories. So for example, it could be that basic vocabulary, the words we use most often, are relatively tree-like, whereas words related to kind of items of trade and technology um, uh, are much more freely borrowed. And similarly, it could be things that we're not so much aware of, you know, uh, certain kinds of typological features of language, these are much more easily borrowed and therefore their pattern of evolution reflects much more geographic proximity rather than deep genealogical descent. So um, I think one does not need to make an a priori choice. The, it, it depends on what aspects you're looking at. And I certainly think it'd be wrong to assume that all aspects of a language fit tidily on a tree or even that you know, a language has one history, that different components of language might have conflicting kind of histories. And that's, there's a slogan in dialectology actually, that every word has its own history, which I rather love, because actually there's also a slogan in, in, in evolutionary genetics that every gene has its own history. Um, so uh, a lot of the time, these kind of histories will, will, will cohere, but, but not always. So I, I think there's, a lot more nuanced things that can be done between either saying I'm a proponent of webs or I'm a proponent of, of trees. Mm -hmm. When it comes to linguistic variation, do we have a good idea of the factors that play a role in constraining it? Mm. There's lots of strong prior positions, but um, I think still there's an awful lot more cool work that is to be done. I mean, one of the things that we're investigating now is um, just how tightly bound together different aspects of, uh, of uh, languages are. Is you know a language like this tightly bound system or are the different components relatively free to vary? Uh, and so um, there's, work that we're doing using causal graph approaches that look in a multi-factor kind of way how tightly bound the different features are and we'll i'm not going to give away the answer um but i, I think we, we are really just beginning to uh really unpack um what factors constrain language because the, the, the comparisons that are typically made have been made in the past uh, have not had access to, to the true variation of human languages. There's, there's roughly, say, 7,000 languages spoken in the world. They've often been, you know, predominantly based on, you know, like in the European languages or European languages that are relatively well known. Uh, but increasingly, I think, with the availability of these larger databases, we're getting a, a much better understanding of the true diversity of the world's languages. And then with the development of these statistical tools, we can tease apart uh, the contributions of you know, genealogical factors, of geographical factors, of fusion and borrowing, and uh, also the role that, that cognitive factors might play and the role that ecological uh, and biological factors might play. Uh, but we're, we're still some way from being able to put all those pieces t together. But I think the combined developments of large amounts of global data coded in a consistent way and these computational methods uh, mean that I think there's a bright future for those kinds of studies and those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that linguists can do when they study the evolution of languages is tying it to migrations of peoples across the globe. So in your case, you've studied the evolution of languages in the Pacific. Uh, what did you learn about the timing of peopling in the Pacific by studying the evolution of the local languages? Uh, so this is actually my, my favorite paper, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> this, this, is the, this is the work that I'm probably the most proud of of anything I've done. Uh, and it, it's still, when I think about it, it still continues to um, just delight me. Um, because what we did was use these like basic vocabulary lists, terms for, for hand, terms for kind of numerals for eye, for, for head, for mother, for father, things like that. Um, and we had a list of just 200 such terms and we had uh, around 400 languages spreading across the, the Pacific and the islands, Southeast Asia. And what really amazes me is just how fine grained a record there is about human 
migration and human history uh, in just these words. Uh, it's a wonderful window into the past. And what we're able to show um, using these Bayesian phylogenetic methods is that these this family of what are called Austronesian languages um, that spans from Taiwan to Hawaii to uh, Rapa Nui to uh, Maori spoken in Aotearoa New Zealand, uh, all the way across to kind of Madagascar um, and including the kind of Philippines. It's a massive, massive expansion. That was one of the last great expansions of people across the across the world. Um, and it's remarkable that we can recover both the pattern of the movement of the people and the timing with incredible accuracy given the, the, these words and Bayesian phylogenetic methods. So we found that all these languages can be traced back to uh, Taiwan uh, about 5,000 years ago. And there was a pause before the settlement of the Philippines of about 1,000 years. And perhaps that's when they invented these outrigger canoes. And then you get this incredibly rapid expansion pulse that goes all the way from the Philippines to, to Polynesia uh, in about 1,000 years. Uh, and also across to Madagascar in the, in the Indian Ocean. It's, it's amazing distances. And then there was this, another pause in central Polynesia, uh, and then the settlements to the most remote parts of Polynesia, Easter Island, Hawaii, Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand. Um, and if you look at the tree topology and the branch lengths, it, it spells out all those things about the, the, the sequence and, and the timing. And that inference, it looks pretty robust. Uh, it fits with what we know from archaeology really closely in terms of the dates. Uh, it fits with what we've seen from genetics. Um, the, there is this strong signal uh, out of Taiwan. Um, the only thing I would add is that that's about the initial colonization sequence that obviously since that time, there's been kind of mixture and there's been contact effects. And, and one of the sort of extra complications is that, um, and I was involved in the genetic work that showed this, that there was a subsequent movement of non-Austronesian speakers into places such as Vanuatu, that although in Vanuatu they still speak Austronesian languages, actually genetically, they've almost been completely replaced by kind of Papuan uh, genotypes. So actually in that case, the languages tell the story of the, the deeper history. That there's this mismatch there between kind of genes and language. Um, yeah, I, I, I love the Pacific, uh, uh, and I, I think it's an amazing story uh, of kind of human migration across these vast ocean distances, uh, and it's all recoverable just by looking at words with these computational methods. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine similar similar analyses have been done for other regions of the globe, correct? And so with the tools we have nowadays from different fields like genetics, anthropology, particularly anthropologists who study human migration and linguists, I mean, there's all these converging lines of evidence to reconstruct the history of uh, language, the evolution of languages, human migration, and stuff like that, correct? Absolutely. I mean, uh, and that's uh, yeah, lots of ongoing work. I mean, it's uh, been done with the, the Bantu expansion in Africa. Controversially, of course, the, the case of Indo-European. Um, but it, it, interestingly, uh, if you compare the debates about Indo-European with Austronesian, uh, our inferences about Austronesian pretty much agreed with what, what a lot of traditional linguists, you know, people who don't use these computational methods had, had thought. Um, but in many ways, the, the analysis there is, is a lot harder because of uh, this really rapid expansion and because of this big variation in retention rates. So the old fashioned glottochronology methods really got the, the Austronesian expansion wrong, whereas these Bayesian methods get it right. Um, so in lots of parts of the world, uh, these trees do seem to reflect these initial uh, kind of population movements, these trees based on basic vocabulary. Um, of course, in Indo-European, there's a huge uh, uh, ongoing uh, debate. Yes, and since you mentioned the Indo-European language, what do we know exactly about it? I mean, are we already able to answer questions like, where did the Indo-European languages came from? How old are they? How did they expand? And so on. 
Yes, I think we can. Um, the um, the but it's a highly polarised uh, debate. Uh, under one account, uh, the Indo-European languages, which are spoken by about half uh, of the world's population, by the way, so hence the kind of large interest in the origins of this language family, you know, that includes uh, the Romance languages, the Germanic languages, the Indic languages, the Iranian languages, some ancient languages in kind of Anatolia. Um, it's, it's a big language family. Uh, under one account, it, it was spread from the Pontic steppe perhaps by linked to horse uh, driven pastoralism uh, going back about five or 6,000 years ago. Uh, and that's the view that has the sort of majority of support from most linguists. Uh, and there has been some genetic evidence that has also been claimed to support that. There's a, uh, an excellent paper by one of my colleagues, Wolfgang Heik and it all, uh, that came out I think in 2015, showing that there was indeed uh, a mass of migration from the Pontic steppe about 5,000 years ago. But there is, there has been an alternative point of view that says that these languages weren't spread by, by conquest or through pastoralism, but, but uh, with the advent of agriculture and they arose not on the Pontic steppe, but uh, further south uh, in Anatolia, kind of like the equivalent of modern day Turkey. Um, and that was a view argued by the archaeologist Colin Renfrew. And, the time depth associated with that debate, uh, with that Anatolian origin hypothesis, would be eight to nine thousand years ago. So, uh, way back, I think in 2003, Quentin Atkinson and I um, dipped our toes into this debate and used sort of early Bayesian phylogenetic methods and, and, and dating to test whether the age of the family was five or six thousand years or or nine thousand, uh, and, and we got about uh, eight and a half thousand. Uh, uh, and that was quite controversial, uh, to say the, the least. Since then, there's been big improvements in the, the quality of the linguistic data and big improvements in the quality of the methods and a huge amount of uh, ancient DNA work. And so uh, my position now is actually one that we hinted at way back in that paper in 2003, that there's truth to both these hypotheses. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, I think uh, our most recent, and we're just revising the manuscript now, unpublished uh, analyses of a, a hugely improved and much larger data set of Indo-European languages shows that the age of this family is about 8,100 years. Uh, and, the, and it's not compatible with a five or 6,000 year. That's for the whole family. Uh, and that, um, but lots of the lineages do split off, particularly the European ones, about five or six thousand years ago. So what we propose is a hybrid hypothesis that we think combines uh, the best uh, and most robust inferences from our knowledge of this, the Bayesian linguistics and what we're seeing in the current genetics. And that is that there was an initial origin south of the Caucasus, maybe not in Anatolia, maybe what's more like uh, uh, modern day uh, Armenia in northern Iran, uh, and then there was a movement uh, both west uh, and east um, and also up kind of th uh, through the Caucasus uh, onto the Pontic steppe. Uh, and then subsequently there was this migration, this massive migration from the Pontic steppe. Uh, uh, and that account reconciles the dates we get for Indo-European with the fact that there was this major migration from the Pontic steppe. But also what we see in the genetics that there is this core component uh, across the range of Indo-European languages um, that you see in the, the genetics that uh, is what they label Caucasian hunter-gatherers. It, it doesn't come uh, from the steppe, it, it comes from south of the Caucasus. And also the fact that in, in some of the languages that are not uh, in on the steppe, uh, for example, samples from so-called Anatolia, um, you don't see a big influx of uh, step speakers. So uh, it's a rather long answer, I'm sorry, but it's been a hugely polarized debate. And I think, you know, it's been going on for 200 years. And I think slowly through the combination of these Bayesian phylogenetic methods and, and the, the wonderful ancient DNA work, uh, we're finding out that both these competing hypotheses have some elements of truth in them. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So uh, now moving on from linguistics to 
uh, your work on certain aspects of cultural evolution, namely religion, big gods, and some religious practices. I've read in your work that notions of God vary with ecology. Could you explain that? Uh, yes, this is some work that uh, started with uh, Carlos Botero and uh, colleagues that we met at uh, a nascent workshop in the in the states, and his background was in in studying avian social systems, um, uh, and we were there for, I think for a, a workshop on um, uh, language evolution, but we got talking about social systems both in birds and in people, and we got talking about uh, you know how some bird species have cooperative breeding patterns. And that whether they're cooperative breeders or not seems to strongly co-vary with, e with ecology. In, in harsh environments, uh, you, you get much higher likelihood that you'll have cooperative breeders. And we thought it would be mischievous to think, you know, are there ecological constraints on God? Do our notions of God kind of co-vary with ecology? And so hence this, this paper arose um, where we got this fine-grained environmental data that led us... Uh, uh, kind of summarize how harsh environments were and how uncertain they were. And we also link that uh, with what's with the cultural data that we now have in this database called DPlace, where we had information on the, the social organization and on whether we believed in big gods or not. Big gods are not just like, you know, the god of the, the tree or the stones or the rocks or the air, but these are big, powerful, moralizing gods that enforce uh, kind of moralizing kind of codes. Uh, and um, when we just first visualized the data, we noticed that the kind of patterns we saw in the presence of belief in big gods, very much like the places where we also saw uh, cooperative breeding in birds. It was in harsh environments. So we more formally modeled this and um, looked at uh, a number of factors that might predict belief in big gods. Uh, harshness of the environment, uh, how, how abundant food was, um, uh, how certain, how predictable the climate was, uh, levels of political complexity. Is there a strongly hierarchical society or not? And other measures like uh, agriculture and uh, animal husbandry. And we also controlled, because languages and cultures are not statistically independent, we controlled for their dependencies due to geographic proximity and also language family relatedness. And I guess, a lot of social scientists might think, yeah, you're going to find nothing much. Human culture is just too complex, uh, you know, and, you know, we are not constrained. Our, our beliefs and social practices are, are not constrained like birds. They're not really influenced by ecology. But what we found was that, you know, sure, no, nothing like crude ecological determinism. It wasn't that ecology explained everything. But in a model that included environmental harshness and, and in unpredictability, political complexity, and animal husbandry, uh, we could explain 91% uh, of the variation in belief in big gods. That's pretty impressive. Like, you know, that's that's an A-plus grade at the, the University of Auckland. Uh, and so uh, I, I was really stunned at the, the fact that there was some predictability. Uh, we're at pains to say this isn't, you know, ecological determinism. It's a combination of ecological and social factors. But, but basically, when life is hard and when life is uncertain, there's a much higher probability of believing in these big, powerful gods. And that's also moderated by it's much more likely in politically complex societies and in societies with animal husbandry. Mm -hmm. Since you mentioned big gods, I mean, there's been this debate going around in the cognitive science of religion between the relationship between big gods and social complexity, and particularly when it comes to where the arrow of causation points to. If, it, if big gods came first, I mean, the notion of big gods, and then that allowed for people to develop more complex societies, or if it was the other way around. Do you have any idea about that? Yes, and we've published some papers on, on this. Uh, there was this really provocative uh, hypothesis that was, was pushed, um, uh, that claimed that you needed to have big gods to make big societies. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a lovely book by Aaron Oren Zayer that has pretty much that as its, its title, but actually the book is much more complex and talks about a whole lot of other factors that also lead to 
um, the evolution of complex societies and um, big gods. Um, so in some work that uh, Quentin Atkinson and I did with uh, our, our student at the time, Joseph Watts, we used these Bayesian phylogenetic methods and we took language trees and we mapped the presence of uh, moralizing gods onto the tree and we also mapped the, the presence of uh, politically complex societies. And there are formal ways of testing whether these things are, uh, 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 evolve together, whether they co-evolve, and also inferring the directionality of the change. And, and we did two kinds of analysis. One where we just looked at moralizing gods, and another one where we looked at these uh, big gods. And in brief, we found that there was a role for moralizing gods. These are smaller gods, um, often multiplicities of them, in uh, ratcheting up politically complex societies. But actually, these big, powerful gods uh, are a very late uh, invention. It seems like they've been borrowed in uh, to these Austronesian societies that we looked at, that um, that uh, they come you know, well after the, the evolution of politically complex societies. And then I guess the question is, is that uh, a general pattern? Um, and uh, I would argue it, across the world, generally, it is. Societies get, get big first, uh, and that the invention of these big powerful gods is basically associated with Abrahamic religions, and it's diffused uh, ar around the world. And there were certainly you know, uh, politically complex societies before the advent of Abrahamic religions. So I'm a skeptic about that claim, but I think it was an intriguing uh, hypothesis and, and a good one to investigate with these uh, cultural evolution methods. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and what is the relationship between uh, religious practice like ritual, human sacrifice, and the evolution of stratified societies? This is, again, some work that was done by, uh, by Joseph Watts as, as part of his PhD. Um, so, the, the big gods hypothesis kind of provided a, a nice kind of pro-social take on, on the role of gods in the evolution of human societies. The converse of that is that rather than you know working for the kind of general greater good, certain religious beliefs and practices might be designed to preserve the power of elites. Uh, and we were interested in particular in, in the role of, of ritual human sacrifice because it you know in the most powerful way demonstrates the uh, power of elites over life and, and death, but also in a way which is divinely kind of sanctioned. Um, so uh, they're and therefore legitimized. So again, we use the same kind of methods to, to, to try and tease whether ritual human sacrifice has a causal role. Because certainly if you look um, you know, historically around the world, in lots of cases, we have had the evolution of uh, complex societies. So the Incas, um, the Aztecs, you also had uh, ritual human sacrifice. But again, using these project methods, we could try and not just see if there was an association, but, but which came first. And what we saw in Austronesian societies, there was kind of strong evidence that ritual human sacrifice ratcheted up uh, the evolution of, of, of stratified societies. So um, that's the kind of darker take on the role of religion in, in the evolution of you know, stratified politically complex societies. Right. And talking about cultural practices, could you tell us about the place, the global database of cultural, linguistic and environmental diversity? Yes, uh, that's uh, a database uh, of well over 1,400 societies. Uh, where we have uh, ethnographic information about, say, kinship systems, modes of subsistence, whether they have agriculture or not. Uh, certain things about religion. Um, and we also have in deep place uh, fine-grained environmental data. And we also link those cultures to, to languages. So uh, basically it was created through this uh, working group. Uh, actually, I had a meeting with them uh, just last night. Um, it was like some late hour. Uh, and so it's an ongoing and, and kind of growing database that links together cultural variation with environmental variation. Uh, and linguistic information. And it's designed to enable the kind of questions we just talked about, like what role does ritual human sacrifice or what role does ecology have in, in shaping the, the patterns of cultural diversity that we see. So that's the rationale for, for Deep Place and uh, we're, we're continuing to expand and grow it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, with that in mind, could you tell us what are some of the biggest challenges with building comparative cultural databases? Yes, it's um, lots of challenges. I mean, coding culture, you know, it isn't easy and isn't theory free. Uh, like if I was to measure my finger, you know, I, I think there's not going to be too much disagreement about the, 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 my finger length. But there could be, you know, if you're looking at other species, what exactly counts as a finger? I mean, there could be, there could be debate. But you know, at least at face value, the, the units in biological comparison, at least at the DNA level, for example, are, are fairly clear and clear cut. Now, it, it, sometimes it can be relatively straightforward in comparing cultures, like you could code uh, certain features of, of house construction, like what kind of material do they use, what was the shape of the house, what was the, the, the shape of the roof, mm, that could be coded fairly reliably. But then other things um, uh, require a, a not so theory neutral, like even the notion of say word order in, in language, people have different ways in which they define word order and there's variation in in word order. So the, there's challenges of abstraction, abstracting away from the variation you see. So if, for example, you have a coach called, called it as being pastoralist, you know, does it mean that every, the only thing they do is pastoralism? Well, probably not. So, but if that's the dominant mode, then that's probably what would be coded. So coding is tricky. And another problem is that you ideally want the decisions about coding to be transparent and, and traceable to particular sources so that people can verify uh, that. So the, the process of coding culture, of making the decisions about how things were coded explicit, uh, that involves lots of scholarship. And I think this is sometimes people from the traditional humanities look a, a bit with the stain at kind of database projects because they think that you lose a lot of the scholarship. But actually, uh, I think it can be quite the opposite. With some large scale database projects that I've been involved in, one of them is called GramBank, where we've coded grammatical data for over 2000 languages around the world. And we've got a team of over 60 different linguists involved. What we can do is make sure that all those fine grained decisions about how things were coded and how they're linked to the literature, to exact pages and grammar, all that scholarship, all the debate about it is, is completely traceable. So we have a kind of traceable record of that now on, on GitHub. So I think one of the, the cool things is you can bring together some of the um, analytical rigor you can get out of cross comparative work, but also with traditional scholarship that really cares in great detail about every single data point. Mm -hmm. So let's now move into the last part of the interview and talk about animal cognition. So you study new Caledonian crows. Are, they, are these a good model of how certain aspects of cognition might have evolved? I think they're a useful one because um, their evolution uh, of uh, their tool making is, is independent. So if, if you look at, you know, we use tools, uh, and our close great ape relatives uh, also use tools. But the evolution of uh, tool use and tool manufacture in birds is, is parallel. So if you have kind of general hypotheses about, say, the role of tool uh, use and manufacture in, say, ratcheting up the evolution of cognitive uh, abilities in, in the great apes, uh, there's limited possibilities for, for comparison. So I think having this independent lineage um, from an evolutionary point of view is, is really quite powerful. Uh, and um, certainly the, these crows have quite you know, impressive tool making abilities, at least as, impre as impressive as I would say as our close relatives, uh, the chimpanzees. They, they make you know, different kinds of tools, they appear to be able to use them quite flexibly. They pass this information on with relatively high fidelity. So there's some cultural evolution uh, of, of these different tool types. Um, and in cognitive experiments, the, um, we can see that they're, that they're capable uh, of doing quite impressively, really, on a, on a range of different, um, particularly causal reasoning tasks. 
And so, I mean, the causal reasoning tasks are those some of the aspects of cognition we can get a grasp on by studying tool crafting in animals? I think um, there's a bit of a limit to what you can infer just from seeing things in, in the field. So, um, the look, what we could see, and this was some work done by my colleague Gavin Hunt, that in the field, they're able to make hook tools from a diversity of different raw materials. So that suggests some flexibility that they've got uh, a kind of final functional hook tool uh, in the head, and then they can adapt different material, whether it be uh, um, a thorny vine or a kind of fern stole on, they can take different raw material and end up with a similar functional product. So that suggests that there's this um, flexibility uh, underlying it and therefore some more sophisticated cognition rather than just rote learning. But really you need to do experiments. Uh, there's a limit to what you can get from just field uh, observations. And that's why we used experiments such as like the, the trap tube task and the Aesop's fable task to kind of probe just how good their understanding of, uh, of causality um, is, to probe their causal reasoning. Mm -hmm. So why is tool use rare? in animals? I, I think tool use is a bit, we're finding it's a bit more common than, than we think. I mean, lots of, you know, there are some birds that will, will drop stones that are using us or, or drop, you know, birds that will drop whelks or snails to, to, to crack them. Uh, and there's crows that will put nuts out on a road in Japan for them to be crushed by the cars. That's, I would think of that as tool uh, use. But I think what's much, much rarer is tool manufacture, imposing three-dimensional form uh, on an object, um, because that requires uh, a lot more goal-directed hierarchical operations. Uh, you know, to make one of these stick tools with a hook on the end of it, you, you've got to uh, break off, the, these crows you have to break off a branch at the fork, they've got to remove all the side leaves, and then they've got to craft away honing at the hook. There's a lot of nested operations there um, with a kind of overall goal in mind. I, I think that's showing a, a lot more cognitive sophistication than, than just picking up an object. Mm -hmm. uh, and are there uh, any other aspects of cognition for which new Caledonian crows are a good model? Um, we've been interested in how they do on social tasks because the, the, the two main kind of theories really about the evolution of uh, Intelligence, to, to use a rather crude word, um, not what I normally use, but just for this, just between us, uh, uh, the, the technical intelligence hypothesis uh, and the social intelligence hypothesis. Technical intelligence hypothesis argues that it's the, the demands of extractive foraging that, that have shaped, um, and in particular using tools that have uh, shaped the evolution of complex cognitive abilities, and the social intelligence hypothesis, rather crudely, that it's the demands of uh, living in, in large social groups and to remember people and their past behavior or individuals and their past behavior, that that's what's ratcheted it up. And I think, again, those are rather kind of polarized views. Um, I'm more disposed to the view that uh, people such as Kim Sterelny have argued that the, in human evolution or in hominin evolution, at least there was sort of co-evolution of technical and of, of social intelligence. Now, these new Caledonian crows are maybe not such good models in terms of like they're not in these very complex social groups. They they basically go uh, they're in small um, small family groups. Unlike some other corvid species, they they don't have striking fission fusion dynamics of groups forming and and splitting. Uh, in the field, we mainly see them in these small family groups. So um, maybe in their evolution, we see a decoupling of the impacts of the demands of, of, of tool manufacture and use from the, the, the demands of kind of complex social life. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, in the various uh, social tasks we've given them, for example, a, a cooperative task, um, th they solve it, but this was a, a stone sharing task. Uh, they can solve it, they can pass a stone to another crow so that the other one, the initial one, can get the food. But 
they do it in very individualistic ways. Really, they're just trying to get the stone closer to the hole. They're, they're not grasping the essence of cooperation and, and collaboration. So the, I think we see in the Nikado and Crows a, a decoupling between technical and social intelligence. Mm -hmm. Looking across different species, is cognitive ability constrained by brain size? Yeah, there's this uh, influential paper that claimed that uh, absolute brain size, the McLean et al. paper that claimed that absolute brain size was the, the best predictor of, of cognitive ability, where they used inhibitory control as a measure of cognitive ability. Uh, and uh, one of my colleagues, Sarah Gelbert and Alex Taylor, and I were, were a little skeptical of that because it depends on how you measure inhibitory control. And the tusks they used, we thought they were particularly unfair to, to birds um, because you know, the, the primates that they, they, they looked at had been, you know, have hands, birds don't have hands. And they'd often been trained to kind of track objects and, and hands. And one of the tasks required them to be able to kind of track hands, an A, not B task. And uh, we did a follow-up experiment showing that if you train the crows to kind of follow hands, that they can then do much better. Uh, it's just not something that they've had past kind of experience typically with. So we were just a little, it's like a lot of debates in animal cognition. You know, the devil's all in the detail. It, it depends on, you know, the interpretations of the, uh, of the, ex the exact experiments. But if, if we, don't focus so much on absolute brain size, but on kind of relative brain size, then, then certainly overall there is some, you know, uh, reasonably robust correlation between relative brain size, that's brain size rescaled by, by body size, uh, and cognitive abilities. So both um, in primates, but also in, in birds, the relatively big brained birds and primates uh, are the ones that often do better on a range of different cognitive tasks. So crows and parrots, uh, are some of the stars of, of, of the avian world. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes specifically to self-control, do we know if there's any relationship between it and brain size? Uh, I'm not 100% up with the literature uh, on that, um, but I, I think it's plausible. Um, the, with a, I mean, where this hypothesis comes from, or one of the things that informs this, I think is a sort of wonderful thought experiment that I think is traceable to, to Sarah Hurdy, uh, where she said, can you imagine chimpanzees being able to queue to get on a plane? And it, no, like anyone who's done work with chimpanzees, tried to do experiments with chimpanzees, knows that they just really lack inhibitory control. Um, orangutans are, are, are much better. Uh, they just get impatient and want to smash the apparatus. And so one of the things people argue that happened in human evolution is we, we self-domesticated ourselves. We kind of ratcheted down our kind of you know, impatience. Uh, and what we see in, in some experiments is that in order to solve tasks, you, you need to attend to the class task closely, gather information. And one of the things, and this is just an anecdote that I noticed when we gave uh, these new cloning trows, new variants of the trap tube task, where there's uh, food uh, in a tube and they've got to work out using a tool how to get it out. The, they didn't just rush in like a chimp would, particularly when we gave them new and rather puzzling versions. They would walk around and around and sit on top and look from underneath. They were gathering information, trying to work out the sort of functional properties of, of the tube, of the trap. Um, so that showed quite a lot of inhibitory control to me. And I think in, in human cognition, people certainly claim that inhibitory control is a, at least a strong marker uh, of enhanced cognitive abilities. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us what is the Aesop's fable paradigm in the study of animal cognition? Yes. So it goes back to, I'm going to hold up a glass. It goes back to uh, Aesop's fable about the, the crow in the pitcher. Uh, the th and there was a thirsty crow and there was a pitcher full of water, but it, it, couldn't, it couldn't reach it. So uh, in this fable, what it does is it drops stones into the pitcher, raises the water level and, you know, then can drink. And uh, so we've used this task to, to probe the, the cognitive abilities to, uh, of uh, nucleotide and crows. And it's also been used in, in, in children. Um, 
And you know, seven-year-old children can, can solve that kind of task. Um, and actually, so can nucleotide crows. They will um, you know, spontaneously drop uh, stones and to, to get access to, say, if I put a piece of food here, it's out of reach, but it's floating on the surface of the water, they will drop objects in. And then we tweaked it. We, we gave them objects of the same size and general shape, um, but uh, some would float and some would sink. And, and they used the ones that, uh, they preferred the ones that would sink. Um, and we also gave them a, a choice between uh, food floating on water and food sitting on sand. And they chose the food sitting on water. So that suggested that they had some kind of causal understanding about the properties of the objects they were dropping into the water and what was needed to raise up the, uh, the water level so they could get the food. Again, of course, the devil's in the detail. We did a follow-up experiment looking at whether that might just reflect biases for different types of objects. And we found that actually, yes, that you know, they did tend to prefer um, some of the kind of objects that were more functional for raising the water. So the exact interpretation is not quite as clear cut. But uh, certainly it seems they grasp some elements of, of the causal understanding, but they, they don't solve it uh, in exactly the same ways as, as, as we would. Um, for example, in eight-year-old children, but not in, say, six-year-old children, if you have a tube or uh, YouTube and um, and a tube that's not connected, and there's a bit of food out of reach here on, on you, and there's another tube up here, they have to learn that dropping food in here, the object will go down here and it will raise the water level up here, whereas dropping over here, it's not connected, so it won't raise the water level. Eight-year-old children can solve that, not so much six-year-old ones. Nuclear learning crows can't. Um, so there are understanding of causality, they have some rudimentary understanding of perhaps of some of the objects and their functional properties, but not the level of depth of causal understanding that, that we would have or eight-year-old children would have. Mm -hmm. So one last question or perhaps one question and then I might have a follow-up to it. Are certain cognitive skills really linked together to create a generally smart species? I'm a little bit skeptical of that, but if I was, um, so in psychology, there's arguments about, you know, is the G, is the general intelligence, so is, is intelligence boilable down to one thing, or is it three things, or eight things, and you, you see much the same kind of debates about animal cognition, that, you know, how modular is, is animal cognition, and I, I think my answer is that I, I'm not sure we really know, I, I don't think we've done systematic comparative tests on um, a, a range of species enough to really know to what extent you can say decoupled social and, and, and technical intelligence and or to what extent they might be related more to some common underlying factor right I, I think it's early days um, and if I had to bet I, I would probably you know go for some boring middle of the road position that there are some elements that are that are specialized that are decoupable uh, and there are other kind of more general cognitive abilities that perhaps facilitate uh, a, a range of things across a range of domains so but that's a very you know kick for touch bland middle of the road answer because i think we just don't have the evidence yet mm -hmm. but do you think that with the evidence we have now and perhaps the number of species whose cognition we've studied uh, does it make sense to talk about one cognition or about one way of being a smart species? I, I think that I wouldn't want to do that because I think that prejudges uh, what future empirical work might, might show to assume that there's just, you know, uh, one dimension of intelligence, I think is a very, very strong uh, assumption. Uh, and uh, because that would require natural selection across a whole range of species to have crafted uh, our brains and our minds, you know, only along this one dimension to not be tuned to differences in ecology, to differences in social situations. So the evolutionary biologist in me is a little skeptical of the, the, the just one cognition claim. Yeah, fair enough. So, Dr. Gray, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find your work on the Internet? 
Sure. Um, the, uh, so I'm based uh, in the department. I'm the director of the Department of Linguistic and Cultural Evolution at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology uh, in Leipzig. So they, if they Google uh, Leipzig and Evolutionary Anthropology, they'll, they'll find the department. If they go onto Google Scholar, uh, the way to find the, the, the publications uh, there. And if they look uh, on YouTube um, and uh, you'll be able to see you know, videos of the crows solving some amazing tasks, including tasks that require like seven or six different steps in order to you know, get to some uh, end goal and that require pulling up bits of um, tools on sticks and dropping objects all in, com in exactly the right combination in order to get uh, the final prize, some food. Um, so the, the crow videos are, are there online and um, they show some of the experimental work we've done and the papers can be found on Google Scholar. Okay, very well. I will be leaving links to that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Gray, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. You're welcome. Me too. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, Ricardo. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching the interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. Any amount, even just $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Espinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafini, Keon Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardis France, and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.